I'm thrilled to be here. What I want to do is share with you what I see as some of the top use cases in big data um, from a business perspective. And then I want to highlight some of what I see best practices, some of the key challenges, and maybe some of the mistakes we need to avoid to make data really the driver of a new industrial revolution. What we're experiencing at the moment is something that the world has never seen before. We now have more data than ever before. The vast majority of all the data we have in the world was generated in the last two or three years. We are expected to see an increase in data from around five to six zettabytes today to about 20 to 25 zettabytes over the next five years. So a massive explosion. And this data is the fuel for this new industrial revolution. I'm a regular contributor to the World Economic Forum, and their CEO, Klaus Schwab, talks about a fourth industrial revolution that we are experiencing at the moment. And I believe data is the base for all of this. If you com combine data with the Internet of Things, with artificial intelligence, with cloud computing, we have something that has never been there before. And what I want to do is highlight some of the use cases, some of the fascinating examples I've seen and companies I've worked with, and then hopefully highlight some of the things we can do better. For me, there are five use cases, and they are all overlapping a little bit, like these jigsaw pieces. The first use case for me is about informing decision making. So this is about using data both strategically and operationally to actually help us make better decisions, understand our world, make better decisions. The second use case is about better understanding our customers and understanding trends and markets and getting a 360 degree view of our customers and what they are doing, what they might be buying in the future. The, second, the third use case for me is again linked to customers, but this time it's about actually improving our customer value proposition. It's all about delivering smarter products and smarter services where we integrate some of the data capabilities and analytics capabilities into what we are offering to our customers. The fourth use case is about automating some of your key business processes. It's about driving efficiencies across your operations. And the last use case is monetization, where we start using data as an asset that we can sell and also as an asset that actually drives the value of our businesses. And what I want to do now is to look at each of these different use cases, starting with decision making, and give you some examples and highlight some of the best practices. One of my favorite examples comes from Google. Google has this ambition that every bit of management decision, every bit of decision making that takes place has to be informed by data. And I loved Scott's mes message earlier that your business strategy has to be your data strategy and has to be your cloud strategy, because this is exactly what Google does. And actually, on a board level, for the holding company Alphabet, they have now identified their biggest business challenges and their biggest business questions. They regularly revise those questions. And their executive chairman, Eric Schmidt, now says that they are running Google based on those questions. So every bit of management reporting that now goes to the board has to help them answer some of these around 35 questions. And as I said, these evolve over time. But what Google wants to do is to make sure that this decision making takes place all across the organization, not just on the very top, but across the entire business. And this is where sometimes more traditional businesses are struggling. How do we give people access to data? One of my clients is Walmart, the largest retailer in the world. And what Walmart wanted to do is to say, we have a 100, 150 petabyte data cloud 
and we want to make this available to our people. So people working in their retail stores, in their headquarters, we said we want to give this to them so they can make better informed decisions. I find this still a big challenge for lots of organizations when they want to enter the self-service world. Because what we often underestimate is the amount it takes to train people, to transfer some of the skills. I've seen lots of self-service projects where they said, here you have a nice little interface, and here you have our 150 petabyte of data. Good luck, you find the answers. And then the challenge is that lots of people don't quite know what data is available, how to analyze this data. So what Walmart did was fascinating. They created these data cafes. They were actually physical coffee shops or little coffee areas where you could come in so any business person could turn up, grab a cup of coffee, and then sit down with a data analyst and say, okay, this is my business challenge, this is my question, how can, we, how can the data help me answer some of those questions? And this is really powerful because this way you would transfer some of the skills, you get some hand-holding. The other thing that I, I, so this whole governance around giving people access to data, we need to rethink a little. We need more hand-holding and we also need to have different structures. So in, in Germany, the Daimler company, uh, Dieter Zetscher, their CEO, says actually we wanted to, that he's now trying to restructure the organization to make it flatter, to give more people access to data so they can make decisions so we don't have all the traditional hierarchy layers that makes it really difficult for people to actually make data informed decisions. The other thing that, as part of this, we need to rethink is some of the job roles. At the moment, I see lots of bottlenecks where data scientists and analysts are the key bottlenecks. And actually, what I've seen success, successful companies do really well is that they have created roles like data translators. So these would be the people that sit in the data cafes that help to bridge the technical and business world and help both of them understand each other a bit better. The next use case, then, is to help us understand our customers a little bit better. And I sometimes get asked, OK, big data is all well and good, but this is just for big companies. So I thought, OK, I'll give you an example from a local butcher's shop. So this is a London butcher's shop. I work with them, and they wanted, they had a few challenges around customers. They said, I actually want to understand what are the kind of marketing messages that will attract customers. I want to understand my conversion ratio, so how many people walk past my shop and end up stopping, looking at the shopping window, and walking inside the shop. So what we thought we'd do is, OK, we said, let's instead of simply relying on your existing data, we find new data sources. And this is, for me, another key message here, is that we need more data diversity. For me. Companies that do well are usually more diverse businesses, and what I find is that more successful companies are also those that have more diverse data sets, where we start looking at external data sources. All the data that is already being generated around us, where we bring in some of the more unstructured data sources like imaging, videos, photographs, voice data, and so on. So in this case, we installed a little device that will pick up our mobile phone signals in the window, in the shopping window of this butcher's. Our mobile phones are continuously sending out signals to find Bluetooth and Wi-Fi connections. So no personal data is being transmitted. And these, because we all carry smartphones, it simply counts how many phones walk past, how many of them stop, and how many of them walk into the shop. So for something like 100 euros, they were able to now have an accurate understanding of customer footfall and conversion ratios, which then allowed them to experiment with new um, marketing messages. So they would change the boards outside. One day it would say, we're competing on price, so come in and we beat the supermarket. Another time, it will be a more inspirational message saying what we are doing is today you come in, you get the recipe that has been passed down through generations, 
you can come in, get the recipe card, and all the ingredients. And this was the message that really worked. What was interesting is that when we analyzed the footfall data, they realized that late at night, around 11 o'clock, there was a big footfall. And they never realized this. So what they did is they applied, say, because there were some pups on the same stretch of, the, of, 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 of this butchers, and they said, if we could open for an hour at night, we could sell them something. And instead of just saying we sell them sausages, they went to Google Trends to see what are some of the key food trends that we're seeing at the moment. And the key trends at this point were shiritsu and pulled pork. So they were now selling, or they started selling in a little pop-up store, shiritsu and pulled pork burgers. And today, 50% of their profit is coming from this one hour at night. The other thing they started to do is to pull in weather data. Most governments now have open data policies where they're making data available. So the Met Office in the UK makes data available. So this butcher pulls in some of this data to help them predict how many sausages they need to make for the next weekend, depending on the likelihood of, of sunshine and barbecues.